Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Katie Smaller. I'm the Director of Educational Programs at the National History Academy, and I'd like to welcome you all here today as we continue our virtual tour series. So each Wednesday at 4 p.m., we're going to be virtually and chronologically working our way through major sites in U.S. history, and today we are joined at, with Jamestown, and we are with uh, the Director of Youth and Public Programs, Mark Summers. So, Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's good to be here. Uh, we have uh, interesting weather. We went from like nice and sunny to windy to uh, cloudy to stormy, but we'll make do because we do <laughs> tours no matter what. Uh, thank you all. Those of you who are uh, students in attendance, I've been working with history, uh, uh, your group for I think three, three years or so now. It's been a couple of years, so I'm excited to do this. We've been doing virtual tours for the last two years, and it's kind of a nice thing to, on a daily basis, to reach students from all over the country. So Without being uh, further ado, we're kind of at the end of our day here, so the crowd's kind of going away. We'll practically have the place to ourselves, but I am in the real place where Jamestown happened over 400 years ago. I'll just give a brief introduction, and I'll turn the camera around. So when I was a student, I grew up south of Richmond, Virginia, which meant that I had Jamestown drilled into my head as a child. If you don't know Virginians very well, we kind of like to be first at everything. And there was a rivalry between Jamestown and Plymouth, Massachusetts for who was sort of first. Now, Jamestown is definitely 13 years older than Plymouth. But after the American Civil War, uh, Virginia history was de-emphasized in textbooks. And Jamestown was seen as not as important, which makes people in Virginia upset. They wanted to say, well, we're first at everything. Long story short, Jamestown became a museum in 1890. Most of the monuments were put up in 1907. And they kind of reflect what people were thinking in 1907 as you study monuments and why people debate them today. But from 1907 until 1993, the tour didn't change that much. Uh, we talked about John Smith, talked about Pocahontas, we talked about how important Jamestown was. And we stood at this park and we looked at monuments and every tour guide used to tell you that the actual site of the Jamestown fort was long ago washed away into the James River. So I'm 43 right now, which makes me the last generation that had this bad tour uh, when I was in middle and high school. I loved history as a kid. I always liked to go to battlefields and museums. I love being in the real place. I don't like replicas. And I was very disappointed after looking at six or seven statues to be told that everything I studied in school was in the river. Well, this is the Jamestown, hold on a second. There, this is the Jamestown I saw. I saw the statue of Captain John Smith. He's been there since 1907. I saw this original church tower from 1690. It's pretty interesting, but it isn't from the time period of early Jamestown. Most of the buildings we saw were monuments from 1907. And again, I was told that Jamestown's original fort was in the river. And the reality was we were standing on it the entire time. In 1994, an archeological dig began. It was only supposed to last for 10 years. And we're now in year 27 of that 10 year archeological project. You're gonna hear me talk about how I change my mind philosophically all the time. Never let anyone tell you when they work at a site or they're a professional store that they don't constantly change their minds because what I'm confronted with, and I've been here almost 10 years now, is now that we've been part of this dig, we've been part of this information, we've been finding millions of artifacts. We're up to 3.5 million. We've recreated the Jamestown Fort the way it looked where it actually was, and we'll go over that today. What we're learning about is the true beginning of the United States was a rough beginning, well before Philadelphia in 1776, even before the Pilgrims. This is a place where different cultures came together. It's far from a rosy story, but at the same time, you're going to find a lot of people from 414 years ago are actually a lot like you and I. When I was a kid, I just thought they were guys with poofy pants and lace collars. The story is much better than that. So this is the actual James River. You can see a ferry boat operating today that's got cars on it. There's no bridge here. And it's operating on the same part of the river that the English sailed on 414 years ago. But a lot of times when you're in history class, and I know you guys are mostly, uh, probably all are honor students and you take a lot of history courses. And I'm going to be honest with you. There are probably times if you were like me, where you might be frustrated with a teacher. You might be frustrated with curriculum. You might be frustrated and say a textbook is outdated. Your gut is telling you that the story is not complete. I want you to trust yourself on that and be willing to actually look and search for better information and, and new information. Because Jamestown is a much better story than I had when I was in high school. You see, when I was a kid, when I was a, a young adult, 
we always were talk, talking about the three wooden ships that came up the James River. I know you've seen these kind of movies and documentaries before, have you not, where you, where you see, it could be about Mexico, Peru, Canada, Massachusetts, Virginia. There's usually some version of the story where they always show the sailing ships from Europe coming up the river or coming across the ocean. And the movie always cues the scary music. Dun, 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 dun. And then some historian gets on TV and says, the such and such tribe thought the Europeans were gods. I want you to throw that out right now. You see, when we talk about English people coming to this place in Virginia, just for geography purposes, I am standing 38 miles northwest of the Atlantic Ocean. So we are pretty close to the shoreline along the actual river where English people built a fort. And we consider this the first permanent, meaning the first successful English colony and what leads to the United States. So it's obviously very important. But I want to tell you right now that in 1607, these are not the first European people to sail up this river. As early as 1530, ships from Spain came up this river. The Spanish came back in 1560, and they came back again in 1570. Only this time, they brought priests from the Catholic Church, an altar boy named Alonzo and a young Powhatan boy who was named Don Luis, who had lived for 10 years in Spain. And their mission was literally to create a mission. If you're from California, it's kind of like your history. These priests were gonna come up this river, establish a mission, and convert the Powhatan people to Catholicism and to be part of the Spanish empire. But it didn't end up so well. These priests were only here for a few months before they ran out of food. They were considered a nuisance by the Powhatan people. They were writing letters to St. Augustine, Florida. And after several months, the letters stopped. And the Spanish in Florida stopped hearing the news about the priests up here. They sent ships up this river to investigate. They noticed Powhatan people wearing the clothes of the, of the Spanish priests. They rescued the altar boy named Alonso, who said, I'm the only survivor. We were betrayed by Don Luis. The priests were killed and our mission was burnt down. When the Spanish heard that news, they loaded up their cannons and shot up the shoreline and killed many Powhatan people that day. This happened 37 years before Jamestown. So do you think that in 1607, when these three ships come up the river, that they're gonna think these English people are gods? No, they're gonna think of them as men, foreigners, different skin color, different clothing, different technology. But they had seen Europeans quite a lot. I'm gonna argue the reactions to be more like this. Oh, it's you guys again. Now I want you to think about this, ladies and gentlemen. When these English people are coming to Virginia, the Powhatan people are watching them. They might be behind trees. They might be watching the English people and they're very close by. See, I'm on the actual island right now where the English people decided to build a fort. And when the Powhatan people were watching the English build this fort, I'm gonna argue right now, this is the most disruptive act in the history of the Powhatan people. The Powhatan people were not one tribe, there were six Native American tribes that grew to be 30 Native American tribes by the time period of 1607. And I think this is very, very important because nobody goes from six to 30 tribes by being nice. Nobody goes from six to 30 tribes by being stupid. Nobody goes from six to 30 tribes without being powerful. So the Powhatan people, they're watching the English. Their villages are close by. One was literally across the river called Cuyahannock. We got a lot of clouds. There's another one eight miles up the river called Paspehe. Now I want you to pretend you're Chief Powhatan. Wahoo Sunakak is his real name, the father of Pocahontas. You personally grew your people from six to 30 tribes. You called this land Sinacomica, the crowded place. You had defeated the Spanish 37 years ago. You knew what European gunships and cannons could do. You traded with other Europeans in the past 30 years. But right now, your tribes are giving you information that English people, foreigners from across the ocean, they're not Spanish, they're different, but they're here and they're chopping down trees and they're building this fort. And you already know what European guns, ships, and cannons can do. And you have a choice to make right now. Do you kill these English people right away for invading your land? You could do that, but you don't know that in the next couple of days, 10 more ships may not come tomorrow and wipe you out. But if you do nothing and you let these English people build this fort, well, you run the risk of them wiping you out. Have you ever had to make a tough decision? 
I'm sure you have. But if you've ever had to make a decision yet that will cost the lives potentially of 14 to 20,000 people, never think of Chief Pouts and it's anything other than you would think of a king or queen in Europe, a powerful person like a president or a prime minister or an emperor who has to be in charge of others. Now the Palatine people who'd seen Europeans before, they're gonna let the English alone for a few days. And what we know about the English as they slowly began to build the fort is that they actually took a long time to build it. And whatever guns and cannons they had were aiming for the river because they were actually not worried about the Palatine people. They were thinking the Spanish were going to attack. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, they've got their cannons in the front door right now, but they hadn't completed this fort yet. The back door was wide open. What I want to do for you right now, now that I'm mobile, and I'm going to be dealing with a little bit of rain, but I'm going to bear with it. I want to take you to the site of the first battle between English people and Native American people in US history. I will take you to the spot. Thousands of people walk on this spot every single day, have no clue what happened here. So I want you to think this third wall right here where the British flag is, has not been built yet. And I want you to pretend that you are an English soldier. You're on guard duty today. You just took four and a half months to get here, four months to get here. You're pretty much what we would call boat lag today or jet lag. You, uh, you're dealing with a lot of, of pain, malnutrition, arguing on board, smells bad. Now you're here and you get this thinking, sinking suspicion that maybe your leaders don't have any clue what they're talking about. So they put you and I on guard duty right now. They told us to get over here and be on the lookout. But like so many people who are young, bored, and away from home, maybe you're gonna goof off. So let's say we're those English soldiers right now. And we're walking to where they would have stood. And they might be over here on this ridge. And they're supposed to look out for anything suspicious. But after a couple of days, nothing happens. So then you go over here and you start looking, you start squinting. And today, after a week of being here in Virginia, you notice something weird. Right where I'm pointing, I want you to pretend you see 20 power 10 warriors. Now look carefully. Now there's 40. A couple minutes later, 60, 100. By the end of the day, 400 power 10 warriors. You're watching them right where the swamp is, right where those trees are. And then all of a sudden, a hail of arrows starts coming towards you. 18 English soldiers were immediately wounded. An arrow went through the beard of your governor, almost killed him. And now you're realizing something. These Native American people that you were told just to avoid, you chose this land because you didn't see any Native American village here. You thought you were good to settle here. And you got a hail of arrows pointing towards you, hitting your friends and your colleagues. And once you think about how you would feel in this moment, would you be angry or would you be scared? because you were probably taught as an English person not to worry about these people. You were probably taught if you were English that they were primitive. But I want you to know something that the British Empire is gonna learn over the next 400 years. Whether we're talking about Sudan or South Africa or India or North America or even the American Revolution or Ireland, people fight hardest when they're fighting to defend their homes, their families, their children, their way of life. We're always taught with books like Guns, Germs and Steel that the English are automatically gonna have the advantage over the Palatines because the English have guns and the Palatines have bows and arrows. But it takes an English soldier 90 seconds to reload a musket. A Palatine warrior can shoot 15 times. And it's the Palatines who outnumber the English in this battle four to one. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, standing on this very spot looking where I'm looking right now, Jamestown could have been wiped out the first week. So the question should be right now, why wasn't Jamestown wiped out the first week? If the fort wasn't finished, the English are actually being outfought and the Palatines are fighting for their own land. Well, there's one little piece of the story I haven't told you yet. The English people still have their three ships here. And those three ships 
or in this river. And they quickly load up their cannons with solid shot. And they fire those cannonballs into the ranks of the Piatin people. Now, something called explosive shell has not been invented yet. So they're not going to be like exploding everything. That's movies. A solid shot's like a bowling ball or a baseball traveling hundreds of miles an hour. If you get in the way of it, it's going to do a terrible thing to you. But cannonballs didn't kill that many people. What they did was scare the mess out of everyone else. Well, if you were standing next to this tree and the cannonball turned it into a hundred splinters, because the English shot those cannons over the heads, if you were a Palatine warrior, that was the time to retreat. And because the English people had their cannons that very moment in time, the English people survived that first week. And then they decided to do something. We better finish the fort very quickly. Sometimes when you're a kid, sometimes when you're a young adult, and you only see in history books people who are much older than you, I want you to remember that every single war that ever happened in the history of this planet has affected young people. Because I'm going to tell you that 18 English soldiers were wounded, right? But two English people were killed in that first battle. And one of the English people killed in the first battle was a teenage boy. And I want to show you where the archaeology team found him in the year 2003. Where I'm about to point where there's a gap in the fence here. And I'll explain how we know the fence was here later. And the gap in this fence, there was a shallow grave about two feet deep. We uncovered a skeleton. And I want to show you what the skeleton looked like. This is the skeleton. We found that the person was a uh, European descended person based on the shape of the forehead and temples. We found the diet was consistent with people who grew up in England. We found that it was a male skeleton based on the shoulders, the hip bones, the jaw was more square like. This is a, a male European. According to his wisdom teeth, he's only 14 or 15 years old. But his shoulder was completely broken by a palatine war club. would be like you and I getting hit with a baseball bat. And in his leg after 400 years, is the arrowhead that killed him. Still right there stuck in his body from 400 years ago. After years of forensic science and research, we identified the young man as a 15-year-old boy from London named Richard Mutton, and this is what he looked like. Now, is this kid a monster? Is he an imperialist? Is he a bad guy? Or is he just a street kid from London who was in the wrong place at the wrong time? You see, ladies and gentlemen, I gotta tell you something very harsh right now. Deserve has got nothing to do with it. That's a quote from a movie. The point is, you may agree with the English or disagree with the English. You may say what the English are doing is completely wrong. But some of the people here from the English culture are actually just kids, street kids, probably forced to come here. And one of them was Richard, and he didn't live past the age of 15. What this tells me is that Jamestown affected everyone. Powhatan, English, men, women, children, royalty, common people, all thrown together. But the first week at Jamestown ended in violence. Repeat, the first week at Jamestown ended in violence. Now, after that first battle, the English people wrote down in their historical records that they completed the fort in only 19 days. And I remember having teachers that kind of scoffed at that and said, how in the world could they get that all done in, in 19 days? Well, there's two answers I have. One, there were still a lot of sailors here to do the work. Number two, what's gonna motivate you to build a fort quicker and if you feel like you don't want to die. But the question should be, how do we know the fort was actually here? Because when I was in middle and high school, I was told the fort was in the river. So in 1994, we began the archeological dig, as I mentioned. We began digging where those two people are talking right now. Remember, there's no fence there. We began digging the first two feet of ground up. And the first two feet of ground is kind of like a time machine blender. The dirt's all corrupted and mixed together. What archaeologists do is they take buckets of that dirt and they pour those buckets of dirt onto a screen. They place that screen on top of a wheelbarrow and it's kind of like fishing with a net. You're going to catch artifacts you want and artifacts you throw back. But anytime you pick up something made by a person, it's an artifact. So I will repeat this when I say this to the public, that a 1987 Mountain Dew can is just as much an artifact as John Smith's pistol. But we're looking for artifacts made and the time period of Jamestown that are English, they're used by soldiers. 
And in some archaeological digs, it might take weeks and weeks before you find anything good. It took our team four minutes to find the first major artifact, which turned out to be a cheap beer bottle made in the 1590s. But you know what you would find outside of an army base today? Some of the same things. We found trash like beer bottles, tobacco pipes, gun parts, broken armor. And we started realizing if we're finding that kind of stuff, we should be where the fort is. So the second thing I'm going to show you is that we found the right kind of trash that we call artifacts. And we know we're digging in the right spot. How do you find wooden walls that rotted away hundreds of years ago? Some of you may know this, but if you don't, I want to show you what a sign here. You find what archaeologists call features. And when an archaeological person says a feature, they mean a person has manipulated the dirt. Think about every time you've ever left a footprint in the dirt. That is a type of feature, a footprint. You can tell the size of your shoe or whether you were barefoot or not, or even the name brand of your sneakers and that, how big your foot was, how fast you were walking whether you had a limp. Well, the same thing is true when wood rots away. <laughs> when wood rots away, it rots away in the shape of what the wood used to be. We call that a post mold. And when you dig a hole in your backyard and you fill the hole back in, you leave a stain called a post uh, hole. I'm gonna show it with you on the sign. How do we know this wall was here? Well, first things first, when you dig about two feet deep in the ground, you start noticing the normal tan or khaki colored dirt has changed color. What we see here is a foot wide hole that was filled in, a trench that was dug. And this is what we call a post hole. Again, every time you've ever filled a hole in in your backyard, you do the same thing. Post hole, that's the foot wide trench. But the wood itself rots away leaving post molds, you see? In the shape of what the wood used to look like. And so what you do is you play a grown up version of the game Connect the Dots. In this picture to the right, it makes more sense. You see the, how the dirt pops color? You can actually look for the circles and you follow where the circles are. Now, how do you know this was done by English people 400 years ago? The trash you find nearby tells you it's the right time period in culture. So in other words, we see this in archeology span and imagine this, so then we can recreate this on the exact spot where it happened, making it look like it actually looked. See, there's a replica Jamestown down the road from us. And they've got nice flat boards that look like they came from Home Depot. Don't mean to criticize, I'm just being real with you. This is actually what the fort looked like. And if you're thinking to yourself, this fort looks rather pathetic, well then what does that tell you? Was it thrown up in 19 days? Did it rot away very quickly? Was it the best built fort of all time? But the English people told us, didn't they? We built a triangle shaped fort with half moons for bulwarks in 19 days. And sometimes we get very cynical and we always think that everyone in the past is lying to us. Well, there's a thing called textual criticism. I learned it in graduate school and you're gonna learn it for free in 10 seconds. People don't lie about boring things, do they? You ever go on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you go on social media a lot, and you know there's a lot of garbage out in social media, right? And generally speaking, you already know how to do this. When somebody is saying something absolutely crazy, it's because it's absolutely crazy. When someone's getting really political, you're probably thinking they're biased. When someone says something that sounds completely ridiculous, it's because it's completely ridiculous. But generally speaking, when someone says something kind of boring, they're probably telling you the truth. If someone was writing down, I lived on Maple Avenue, or I went to the grocery store and I bought bananas and a box of cereal, they're probably telling you the truth. And you do the same thing that you do on social media when you look at 400 year old pieces of paper. In other words, if you ask yourself the question, who's gonna lie about building a triangle shaped fort? Nobody. And so we found this wall in 1994. Oh boy, the wind is bad. Okay, I'll get out of the way of this weather real quick. This is the first wall we found in 1994. But we needed to find two more walls. So we found the second wall around the corner in 1995 by playing Connect the Dots. And it was right over here. Three choices of each shape. Number one, wall number two. Now, the third wall in the distance where we just were before in 2003. Well, I'll call that a triangle shape. And then they said a half moon bulwark. That means curved wall of the cannon. Well, look at what we found in 1995 to 1996. We found this curved wall right here why we have a cannon here.
and there would have been four to five cannon in each corner of the fort. These cannons, which can shoot about 900 feet, fire a softball sized shot. They're aimed for that angle of the James River because the English are actually more terrified of the Spanish coming up the river than they are of the Powhatan. But they weren't lying to you about building this fort. And here it was. This is the fort they completed in 19 days. Now remember, they completed that fort after the first battle. And they were motivated to build that fort quickly so they didn't get attacked again. And the Powhatan will never get that close again to defeating the English. But they don't have to. You have to understand the English people for the first year at Jamestown are defeating themselves. Now I want to go back a little bit because you're learning this in school. And you have to ask yourself, why on earth are the English people here? Well, you have to go back and remember that as early as 1497, English people claimed North America for themselves. That's John Cabot going to Newfoundland. So that means for 110 years, the English have tried and tried and failed and failed to start a colony. If you're familiar with the Roanoke colony in North Carolina, that's a very famous failed English colony. But it's actually one of 10 or 11 failed English colonies. If you think about the phrase, the sun never set on the British Empire. But to be really honest with you, in 1607, the sun has not risen on the British Empire. The English are bad at this. And Queen Elizabeth, called the Virgin Queen, remember Virginia's name for her, greatest leader maybe in English history, they don't get it done when she's the queen. And because she died without children, because she died and her brother and sister had already died before her, they have to figure out who's going to be the king or queen of England. So they invite the king of Scotland, named James, Become the king of England. And that's why they call the river the James River and this town Jamestown and this fort James Fort. We're in James City County, Virginia, and there's a King James Bible translation. It's the same king. Now, the thing about King James is he's very different than Queen Elizabeth. He thinks colonies are stupid, he thinks colonies are a waste of money, blood, treasure, and effort. You're not leaving the country without King James' permission. He's not going to pay for it. Not one red cent. So King James and his lawyers write a charter for an organization called the Virginia Company of London. In other words, it's a private organization of rich people in England who invest their money because they say there's money to be made in Virginia. And these rich investors, they actually form a court company. And I'm saying we would call this today a startup. And they form this startup called the Virginia Company precisely to make money. They have a board of directors. And they have dues, and they have meetings, and they do what big companies do. But I'm going to tell you, these men are not the people coming to Virginia. They're going to find desperate people to do it for them. So the little thing to the Virginia company might be spent. Think about Elon Musk is a billionaire and wants to fly to Mars. Remember this summer when Jeff Bezos from Amazon flew to space? How many people on the news made fun of that? And here's what I think. They missed the point. I kept thinking all summer long, boy, does that sound like Jamestown. Great things in history are often financed by billionaires who just want to make more money. But sometimes great scientific and political achievements happen anyway. So your generation, as you get older, is going to see space travel turn into the same thing the English are trying to do 414 years ago. But that's precisely the problem. If Jamestown was founded by people in London, who, number one, have never been here before, number two, aren't coming here personally, and number three, are interested in just making money, could you agree with me that perhaps they might be giving orders that make no sense? They got three ships. They crowded 104 men and boys into those ships. They told them they were going to find gold and silver. It took them four months to get here. And when they landed in Virginia, they had to follow four important rules. They landed in what is now Virginia Beach, next to the Atlantic Ocean, 38 miles that direction. But when they opened up the letter of instruction, they were immediately told they can't stay there, or they will be blown up by the Spanish. So they were supposed to sail 100 miles up the James River. But they don't know that James River, you can't sail past 70 miles. When you get 70 miles up the river, you hit waterfalls, which is now where the city of Richmond is. So they went back this direction, and built this fort 38 miles away from the ocean. I'm going to give them half the check mark. The second thing they were supposed to do is build their fort next to a river that was very deep. 
Now, if I walk into the James River right now, it might be up to my armpits. But we don't allow swimming here because it drops off suddenly 20 feet. And right where the ferry boat is, you might make out a green buoy. That tells modern day sailors that that's the river channel, the deep end of the river. It's 35 feet deep right there. Deep enough for ocean going ships to, the, to this day, to the 21st century. The ferry boat is actually on the same part of the river the English used 400 years ago. Big check mark, the English know how to sail. The third thing they were supposed to do is build a fort on high ground. Well, it doesn't look like high ground if you're from Colorado, but we're standing on top of a big actual hill. And you want to build a fort on the hill if you're in the army. It's easier to shoot downhill than uphill. It's hard to run uphill to defeat somebody. Big check mark. They did a good job there. So far, they have two check marks and one half check mark. In other words, they're halfway up the distance they're supposed to be. They found a nice deep river, and they actually found a good hill to build a fort. So far, so good. But the fourth thing they were told to do is to pick a place to live where they didn't see any Native Americans, only they called them the naturals. So they noticed there was no Native American village here. You know what they probably thought, well, this place is perfect. But here's the problem. I wish somebody had said, hey, why are there no Palatine people living here? Well, the answer is the water's terrible. It's brackish, it's salty. It was even saltier back then because we know there was a drought going on because of tree ring data. So it was the worst drought in 770 years, only they didn't know it. There's a swamp behind me that has poisonous arsenic in it. We know the soil here is so sandy that when people use the, the toilet, the restroom, that human feces and animal feces creates what? The E. coli bacteria that got sucked into their well water, creating the diseases called typhoid fever and dysentery. This is pretty much the worst place they could have picked from a health point of view. And the fact that Native Americans didn't live on the island should have told them that. So right away, following the rules written by people who don't know what they're doing and don't know what they're talking about, absolutely can get people killed. Just ask that young boy, Richard Mutt. This whole story of early Jamestown is really a story of leadership. And in many cases, it's a story of bad leadership. And we're getting the details, but actually doing the archeology. span I'll give you an example. In 2009, we actually found where Jamestown's first well was. Now we had to fill it back in, but it's right here where the gravel and the white pipe is. We dug this out and it was 17 feet deep. And we pulled out 600,000 artifacts. This is what the well actually looked like when we did the archeology. span We went all the way down to the water, pulled out a lot of crazy stuff. But then we did something else cool. We have friends at the College of William & Mary from the geology department. They drilled holes, put these white PVC pipes all over the island. They have scientific instruments to test the water. It's called the aquifer, the natural underground water supply. So they put a hundred of these test wells in the entire island. This is a few years ago. And what the William & Mary scientists found out is of the hundred test wells they actually put all over this island, the actual place that had the highest level of E. coli bacteria on this island today is in the exact same location of where the Jamestown people built their first well. With every drink of water, they were slowly killing themselves. Dysentery is diarrhea bad enough to cause blood loss and dehydration and kill you. Typhoid fever can give you a temperature of 105 or 6 degrees. These diseases we now know are caused by the bacteria from human and animal waste, which is why in countries that are developing, when they have a hurricane or earthquake, you notice people in the news talking about dysentery or typhoid or typhus. That's what they mean. When you hear about Civil War soldiers are more likely to die from bad water than from bullets, that's what people mean. They don't have microscopes. They have poor scientific medical knowledge. And with every drink of water, they're killing themselves because they picked a terrible place to live. And science can actually prove it. This place was not a nice place, and I cannot scream loud enough about the annoyance. We still we have generations of people who think this is the old butter churning. Generations of people that think this is a quaint, cute story. As if people 400 years ago didn't suffer like people suffer all over the world today of disease, and war, and starvation. These are people like you and I, and they're being led by incompetent commanders. And I don't, I don't pull my punches, ladies and gentlemen. The first commander was so bad, he was hoarding food and supplies and wine for himself while his own soldiers were starving. So they fired him. 
The second commander was even worse. He was working soldiers to their death to build him a palace in the woods. And they were living in muddy holes in the ground right by the wall there. The third commander was a nice guy. He decided to quit because you could be too nice for this job. And I want to tell you that the original 104 people here, by the end of the first year, only 38 were still alive. So they go from 104 to 38 people. Two thirds of the men are dead. There's no gold here. There's no silver here. The Palatines want the English off the island. The Spanish never show up. The port was built too late. The well water is killing them. And they go through three bad commanders. This is a terrible story. This is a colony that should have failed. But why didn't it fail? Maybe because the fourth leader of Jamestown was actually kind of good at his job. The fourth leader of Jamestown is this man here in the statue, Captain John Smith. I want to rescue him from being a cliche or a cartoon character. John Smith was never the guy in the statue. The statue is when he's 47 years old. It's a later picture of him. The John Smith we always see in history class is an older John Smith at the end of his career. But the John Smith that would have actually been here was 27 years old. He was a farm kid from a place called Willoughby, Lincolnshire. Today, Lincolnshire is England's most rural county. In other words, you could compare Lincolnshire to, to London the way you would compare, say, Mississippi to New York City. John Smith, what we call in Virginia, a good old boy, came from a farm community, ran away from home when he was a 16-year-old, fought in three different wars. He was a veteran of three wars by the time he was 25 years old. And in this last war, Several eyewitnesses said that he actually won three back-to-back -to -back -to -back duels against Turkish commanders in the country of Romania. You might be able to make it out, but on John Smith's cut of arm are the heads of the three dead guys he killed personally. This is the kind of the guy who's trying to tell you something. He's a tough guy. He's a military guy. He's a farm boy. He's working class, and he's trying to crawl his way to the top of English society and he hates the English class system, and they think he's basically a hasty to rude, but no boy. He's an angry guy, but he's smart and he's tough. And in Jamestown, he takes over in 1608. I had teachers that said that John Smith was, a, was, a, was obnoxious. He was a liar. He bragged too much. But it is quite possible to be obnoxious and right. So when John Smith took command in 1608, think how pathetic a scene it would be. Now, there were more settlers who came every six months. So they kept throwing more people here. But on John Smith's first day on the job, I can tell you where he was standing, right where this model is. And I want you to pretend the model's not here. There was a barn right here called the storehouse where the supplies were kept. Now, remember, 50% of the colonists are gentlemen. They aren't rich guys. They're mostly younger sons of rich families. When you're, younger, when you're the youngest son of a rich family, you inherit an attitude but no cash. And these men are not working. And because they're not working, half the people are doing the work for everyone else. And John Smith being working class doesn't like this. So on his first day on the job, like an angry football coach, he calls a meeting right where I'm standing. It's one of the most famous events of James that took place right where I'm standing. He looked people in the eye and said something very, very interesting. He said, after he locked the door of this building, he that will not work shall not eat. In modern day terms, you'd say, I don't care who your daddy is, son. You're picking up the shovel. I can almost see the young soldier slow clapping because he made these rich guys work, right? On the other hand, you're talking about very powerful, well-connected people who are going to be very upset today that John Smith just told them they got to work. But that makes him a good commander. He sounds very American, by the way. Now, the point is, that's a good thing for John Smith, I think. And there's other good things about John Smith. And I will tell you one of the other things he did. Remember, his soldiers, the soldiers were upset because they were living in the mud. Being rain, I'm being rained upon right now. Like I said, it's not pleasant. Rain, heat, snow, ice, hail, hitting you in the face while your commander has a palace in the woods. So one of the first things John Smith said he did, order the construction of four barracks for the men. And I was told in history class, this man's a liar, huh? Well, what are our 
archaeology team found by playing connect the dots was four rectangle shaped buildings right here along the wall. Now we rebuilt one of them for you. We're still working on it. But by playing grown up connect the dots, we can actually find that this is indeed a rectangle shaped building. By playing connect the dots, we can actually see where the door would have been. And we're going to walk through the actual location of the actual door of the actual building. And as we walk into the building, we would notice immediately in front of us a fireplace. It would have been covered in mud. And there would be a bedroom right over here to the right. And there would be a bedroom over here to the left. And because we realized that these poles were built about two feet deep in the ground, it's actually a two-story structure, which means there's a room number three and a room number four with ladders to get up to the top. Now, we call this type of architecture mud and stud architecture. We actually would notice that they built the building very quickly. It doesn't need to be an architectural plan. You stick the poles in first, then you hammer up these small sticks, and you cover them with mud. And we're trying to do that right now. And the reason this is important is how do we know that John Smith did this? Well, mud and stud architecture survives in England today. I want to tell you, 100 of these buildings are still standing in England right now. 100 mud and stud buildings are standing in the entire country of England right now after 400 years. I'll show you a picture of what one of them looked like. This is a surviving mud and stud building. This is us kind of rebuilding one. And this is what it looks like when you play connected dots. Now, where do you find these buildings? Well, out of the 100 surviving mud and stud buildings, 96 are found in Lincolnshire, which is, of course, where John Smith comes from. And the only other person from Lincolnshire is the head carpenter. This is an architectural pattern from John Smith's part of England. Now, what does that tell us? He's not lying. That's one thing it tells me. This is the second thing it tells me. John Smith just got the soldiers out of the mud. And when you get the soldiers out of the mud and you put them in a house with a roof and a fireplace, where well, they're out of the mud, what you have essentially done is give your soldiers their dignity. And when you give soldiers dignity, they're going to fight for you, not the other leaders. John Smith's a good leader, number two. The third thing John Smith that makes him a good leader is the fact that he's actually someone who's willing to negotiate with the Palatine people. Now, you may know some of this story, that before John Smith became the boss in 1608, he wasn't going to sit here and starve. So he took two soldiers with him, put on his armor, got in a small canoe, and rowed up the James River looking for food. He got out of the boat. He told the other two guys to stay on the boat. He went exploring in the woods. Now, in this part of Virginia, it's very swampy, and you can get lost. I've been out in the woods as a kid. It's very, very hard to have landmarks on flat ground. It's swampy. It's foggy. You can get yourself lost. And Smith got lost, and he was captured by the Palatine. And they dragged him to the shoreline, and they showed him the dead bodies of the other two guys. And that universal language is telling John Smith, you're coming with us. Now, what's interesting about that is people often ask me, why did the Palatine people not kill John Smith? Because he looks like an English chief, and he's going to be really good for intelligence. He spent the next 60 days as a prisoner being taken to Palatine villages, where he communicated through pictures and sign language. And they want to know, why are you here? And Smith lied to them. Eventually, he meets Wahoo Seneca. We call him Chief Palatine. He says, everything's going fine. So eventually, they dragged me out of the house, and they were going to bash my head open with sticks and kill me. But at the last moment, 10-year-old Pocahontas jumped on top of me to save my life. Now, as you probably know, there are some people who are going to say that story is completely made up. No, it's completely true. If I were to tell you that John Smith may have misunderstood what has happened. In other words, I'm going to tell you, Chief Palatine is not stupid. He's not going to feed a guy for 60 days just to kill him at the end. In other words, if you want to kill John Smith, you're going to kill John Smith. What may have been happening is that that was a staged event. It was a fake killing. They're trying to convince John Smith, we can kill you anytime we want to. Now let's do some business. In other words, we would call that negotiating.
You see, if you're Chief Powhatan, you're dealing with the English now for almost a year. And you know that they're in the sport, and they have armor, and they have guns, and they have cannons. You know that the last time you tried to attack them, you almost got wiped out. So maybe what you want to do is trade with them, do business with them. But you have to convince the English that you're not a pushover. You've convinced John Smith, you got to do business with us. I want you to remember that story because I think John Smith did three good things. He made everybody work equally. He took care of his soldiers. He was smart enough to take the deal with the Powhatan. And the thing that kept the English alive during Jamestown's second year was that Powhatan women and children began bringing baskets of corn to the English people. And the Powhatan saved the English lives by giving them that corn. Now, corn isn't just something you buy at a grocery store. The link about corn or maize is very important as you can dry it and preserve it. It can get your people through the winter. Corn is valuable. Corn is life and death. You better have corn if you want to make it to the Virginia winter. But when I was a kid, I was told the Powhatan people just started feeding the English for free. I was told by very well-meaning people that the Powhatan people fed the English because the Powhatan people are nice people. But I want you to know there are nice people and mean people of every culture and any time period in history. So my guess is that's not a good answer because you actually think you're respecting the Powhatan and you've just actually met, met, uh, said their entire civilization was naive and foolish. But I know Chief Powhatan isn't that kind of person. In other words, Chief Powhatan used to charge, get this, every one of his tribes had to pay 90% of their corn in taxes to Chief Powhatan. That's not a guy feeding the English for free. What archaeology tells us is not only do we find thousands of pieces of Powhatan pottery, and we find corn cobs and acorns and deer bones that absolutely prove that the Powhatan fed the English, yeah? At the same exact time, we're finding things like blue beads, copper, and English metal tools. These are gift items the English are paying the Powhatan. This is trade, this is business. I would argue this, it's the English paying the rent. It's the English paying taxes. When your parents paid taxes to your county, to your city, to your state government, to the United States government, remember this, the act of paying taxes means you're acknowledging who is the authority where you live. I don't pay taxes to Switzerland. I don't pay taxes to Japan. I pay taxes to the United States. They just take it out of my paycheck because that is the actual government I have allegiance to as virtue of being a citizen. So when the English people are paying taxes to Chief Fountain, you know what they're doing? Whether they realize it or not, they're acknowledging that Chief Fountain is the Lord of the land, not themselves. So let me give you a quick review. Year one of Jamestown was an absolute disaster where the English tried to do it on their own and they nearly got wiped out with three bad commanders. Year two, John Smith takes the deal with the Powhatan and what happened? The Powhatan feed the English, but the English got to pay for it. So there's this year of relative peace. But lest you think I'm being overly rosy here, one gets the impression that Chief Powhatan's waiting for the opportunity to get back at the English. He's buying time. And one gets the impression that John Smith is lying to the Powhatan to buy time for the English. Because I want to go over one other major year. 1609, it all falls apart. During Jamestown's third year, it all falls apart. John Smith was asleep on a canoe while wearing a bag of gunpowder, and the gunpowder happened to blow up accidentally, yet very suspiciously. And John Smith was hurt so badly, he was shipped back to England and never came back. Some people call it an accident. It may have been a murder attempt. Remember those gentlemen never forgave John Smith for making them work. Chief Powhatan was annoyed in English. He realized I'm feeding these people, but I'm not getting much out of it. They're not giving up their guns. They're not giving me their armor. They seem to be wanting to take too much from me. Then the next English person, the best way to get food from Powhatan, was to take it without trading for it. Well, that honestly means it's if you were out for 20,000. So why did it all fall apart? The 
Powhatan realize they don't like the deal they have with the English, and the English feel like they don't need the power. Something terrible is going to happen next. From October of 1609 to May of 1610, we have what's called the starving time, right? Remember I told you the Powhatan people were no longer able to take this fort down. The English are too powerful. But you don't have to take the fort down, ladies and gentlemen. You just surround it. I want you to think of a very tight siege. The English people get killed when they try to get fort. The siege is so the wall of the floor come a coffin. 100 people that started the starving time, 340, excuse me, 340 people were here at the beginning of the starving time. By the end of that six month period, only 60 were left alive. We are told by the survivors that they had to eat cats and snakes and rats and dogs and horses and mice and shoe leather and even our dead fellows. Sorry for the rainy day, but we have some pits that are normally open. In the well I showed you earlier, we found 600,000 artifacts from the starving time. Where this tarp is, we found a kitchen. In 2012, they had 47,000 artifacts from the starving time. And we also found what's called fondle remains, meaning bones. We found, for example, dog bones like this. Butchered dogs. You think that's not a lot of dogs? We have a table that was stacked three feet high from dog bones we found. We know that the English had six horses at Jamestown at the beginning of the starving time. Well, we found all six, and they were all eaten. When I had a college professor 20 years ago saying that they didn't cannibalize each other, that's a made-up story. Really? Well, right here in 2012, we found the skull of a 14-year-old English woman. This is what she looked like. And there were cut marks all over her skull we found in 15 pieces. We went to the Smithsonian. We went to Waterbury Naval Hospital, Georgetown, forensic scientists in London, Berlin, Canada, the United States, and multiple universities, and they all came to the same conclusion. That this 14-year-old girl had eight out of the nine criteria for survival of cannibalism, but only five were necessary. And she was thrown in the trash at age 14. We proved that cannibalism happened. And it happened because the leadership at Jamestown was flat out awful. This is the second time in our tour. We we'll do one more story and we'll finish. This is the second time during my tour where the English people almost got completely wiped out. So they got rescued. 1610, two fleets of English ships rescued the starving time victims. One was two ships that had missed the starving time because their ship had crash landed in Bermuda. It's called the Sea Venture. Those two ships that were built in Bermuda were full of the refugees who came here to feed the English people that they described as walking skeletons waiting to die. But they were going to abandon Jamestown. But they were turned around trying to leave this place by nine ships led by a guy called Lord Delaware, your new boss, your English, one of the 50 most powerful people in England. And we are told that he busted through the doors of the fort. Right where Smith's statue was, was the main gate to Jamestown. Where I'm now standing was Jamestown's first church. And if you were a starving time victim, he just busted through the door. You slowly get up to take off your hat. And he walks right, right here, right in front of you. In Lord Delaware, he says, no more common law and rights of Englishmen. We're going to have military justice. And Lord Delaware says, I don't feel sorry for you. It's your own fault for letting the Palatin beat you in a war. And he said to his soldiers, from this day forward, we're going to give the Palatin Irish tech. We're going to treat them like we treat the Irish. When they hit us, we hit them back so hard, they'll never hit us again. And he selected two Palatin villages to wipe out. And I mean that for real, wipe out. Kikatan, 30 miles behind me, and Paspahay, 8 miles in front of me. Those two villages were destroyed, and anybody they tried to catch was killed. No quarter. The whole point was to send a message to the Powhatan that if you mess with us, we mess with you times ten. But just like the Irish, the Powhatan fought back. And for the next five years, what we have is called the Anglo-Powhatan War. It reminds me of the Vietnam War for the 1960s and 70s. The English had the advantage of having guns, fast-moving ships, cannons, and armor. The Powhatan had the advantage of knowing the landscape, 
fighting for their own country and setting up ambushes and traps. And in wars like this all over the world, and including one that just happened recently, you can see advantages and disadvantages for either side. And they don't take long for wars like this to bog down where neither side can win very easily. So after five terrible years of warfare, it killed people on both sides. That was bad for business. The English finally gained an upper hand by capturing the now 17-year-old Pocahontas and attempting to treat her, trade her for all the English prisoners. But when Chief Patton refused to make the deal, she stayed with the English longer than she was supposed to. She learned the English language. She adopted the Christian religion. She called herself Rebecca and wore English clothing. Now you can say, if you're suspicious, was any of that her choice? Probably not. But John Rolfe, the man who's planting the very tobacco that's going to make the English rich, said that he fell in love with Pocahontas and asked permission to marry her. The reason that's important is that both sides realize there's a way to end the war. On April 5th, 1614, through this door, Pocahontas, now age 17, will walk up this aisle, and in front of you would have been Pal, Ten, and English people. And in front of you now is John Rolfe and the minister, Richard Buck. And when John Rolfe and Pocahontas said, I do, right here in the front of this church, this very spot, 400 years ago, the war ended in the same spot where it began five years earlier. Irish tactics to I do. And there were hopeful faces in that crowd, hoping that the violence was over. And for the next seven years, it would be peace at Jamestown. During those seven years, the church would move. There would be representative government, the establishment of common law, the spread of the English language, the growth of tobacco, and the establishment of Jamestown as a permanent colony. All sounds nice and rosy. But from a Powhatan point of view, those seven years saw the loss of a lot of their land and a threat to their culture. All the way up to 1622, the English felt like everything was good. But in the distance, 399 years ago, there was a new chief named Opechanknu who was waiting for the moment to strike back. On a peaceful morning of March 22nd, 1622, at eight in the morning, Nearly one-third of the English colony was wiped out on a single day by Palatine warriors who took weapons and blunt instruments and knives from the English people's homes and killed everyone they saw that day. The English never saw it coming. They were almost wiped out again for a third time. My last point is this. Then the English hit back. See what I'm getting at? What's going to happen for the next 100 years, 200 years, and 300 years in American history between colonists, settlers, and the Native American people. So Jamestown is complicated like that. It's full of wonderful stories like Pocahontas' wedding, John's been telling people off, the birthplace of representative government, Chief Powhatan is a wise ruler, but it's also full of stories that are painful and hard and controversial to the present day. Jamestown is not good guys and bad guys. Jamestown is the same world we live in right now 400 years later. When I turn on the news, I see Jamestown. When I turn on the news, I say everything that happened today is because of what happened 400 years ago. I don't see history as trivia. I see history as something that affects us to this day. It's current events. All right. It's five o'clock. Can we do maybe like 10 minutes of questions? Is that okay? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, Mark, so much. I guess we've got so many positive comments uh, coming in. Oh, good, so that good. Was, that That's the way beautiful. I roll here. I hope you liked it. <laughs> and I will say, uh, Ben had to leave, but we had a former student who was on the call from 2018, and you and his visit to Jamestown in 2018 inspired him to Excellent. get to the history field, and he's now, uh, that's his major in college. Excellent. All right. Great so, all right, we've got a few questions here. Uh, first of all, were the settlers, is there a reason they chose the Virginia area in particular? And then once they realized how bad it was, did they ever consider going somewhere else? Yeah, the, the thing that the English want, what we would say today geopolitically, is Jamestown is in a bad area, but most of Virginia is not so bad. What I think I would say is they're selecting the Chesapeake Bay for the same reason the United States Navy has it. 
Chesapeake Bay, uh, Hampton Roads area of Virginia is one of the most strategic harbors in the entire world. We are not too far away from where they park aircraft carriers. But Jamestown is in a very bad spot where the land is swampy, it's hard to grow things, and there's a, a, a high salt content. So it's not a good place for living, but it's very defensive. So again, miles away, they wouldn't have run half the problems. But then, what can't really get away with here is kind of, in many ways, finding a peaceful solution. Because as soon as the English figured Jamestown wasn't a great spot and tried to spread out away from it, it inevitably created more wars with the Powhatan. See what I mean? Because the English figure out the Powhatan are living on the best land. So they're going to want that land. And it's going to lead to conflict. So yeah, it's strategic. It's big picture strategic. The Spanish wanted it. The Powhatan had it. The English wanted it. Um, it's very strategic land. You think about how much American history happened along the Chesapeake Bay, right? The Revolutionary War, Yorktown, Civil War. Um, we have a lot of Army bases, Navy bases to this day here. Strategic land. It's always been strategic. Deep rivers, good harbor. So that's probably why. Will, uh, will you ever rebuild the barracks? Uh, yeah, we're working on it. It's going to take us. Um, the idea is we're going to finish uh, putting the sticks up and mudding the walls over the next few months. I don't think we're going to attempt to do the roof made out of thatch. That's going to be too dangerous. So we'll probably put uh, canvas coverings on top of it to make it rainproof. We have living history people who come out here and we're going to have use the building for filming for YouTube videos. So yeah, we'll probably have it done in the next four to six months. Uh, other than that, are there any future programs or projects in the works that you think might uh, help shed some more light on life in Jamestown or anything? Certainly, yeah, I do a variety of things. Um, this is kind of the current tour I'm doing because next year is the fourth anniversary of the Powhatan Uprising. And that's one of the five most controversial things about Jamestown. And believe me when I say we have a lot of controversy here, a lot of the issues that people are arguing about back and forth in this country are rooted in Jamestown. And I always encounter people of a variety of politics and backgrounds, you know, and they may all see Jamestown differently. And it's kind of my job to kind of navigate that, to, to kind of tell the story for as many people as possible to understand that they may have differences of opinion of what Jamestown means, and people felt the same way hundreds of years ago. So I have a, a program I do on the first Africans, and I'm actually investigating not only race relations at Jamestown and the establishment of slavery, but how it's more complicated than and you're hearing back and forth in the news. And uh, I'm interested in learning about people of color that actually lived in England at the time of Jamestown and how maybe their experience as free people is different than what happens in Virginia. Uh, and I'm finding that research very interesting. And I'm gonna start incorporating that a little more. And then the tour I just gave you, I actually originally started doing for military groups. And, uh, and now I do it for kids and I do it for um, the public because it, it's really about leadership. But it actually started out as, um, what we do for actual um, army officers uh, when they come here to learn about Jamestown. So you, you can definitely be a tour guide and actually um, do things that um, shape foreign policy. I've met some interesting people at Jamestown doing tours. I've met uh, Army General H.R. McMaster who commissioned this tour that you just had. I met um, senators, you know, senators and political figures, governors. Uh, I've met um, Ozzy Osbourne, who filmed the TV show here. And I met um, Bill Belichick, who was one of the smartest people I've ever talked to about military history. So it's interesting who you get to talk to. Cool to see people from other walks of life who view Jamestown as something they're interested in and they can learn from. So. I'm not trying to say I contributed to a Super Bowl victory, <laughs> but it is you meet such people and find out they're kind of regular people. Yeah, kind of cool, fun job. It definitely seems it. Um, you showed some images of like the digital faces from the skeletal remains. Do you know how those come about or whose job that is to create those? I don't have a lot of the good scientific knowledge to tell you how, but I can tell you that it, forensic artists people who work on things like the FBI and, and solving murders and things like that are using the same computer programs and techniques 
for us when we commission their help. And mostly these facial reconstructions are about 90% accurate to what a person looked like. Um, that's pretty cool that we can get that way. Now, when we did the Jane one, this was in 2012. Now they know each other. They didn't know that uh, 400, like 10 years ago. So the technology is rapid. And, uh, and we're finding out that like people look different than we expected. So I wonder, um, like we might know Jane's eye color or hair color. Um, better if we were to redo it. But anyway, they're getting really, really much better at that kind of work. Um, and so now you're getting realistic facial models. But if you if you look at National Geographic from 30 years ago, you know how like people didn't look too realistic, they look kind of fake. The technology wasn't that good, but now it's getting really good. It's almost like a photograph. That's pretty cool stuff. And that's just been since I started working here. Is there any evidence of indentured servitude at the site? Uh, hard to say because a lot of people here are poor. I will tell you there's a part of the park where we find where enslaved Africans and indentured servants live, but in many cases their material culture, meaning their pipes, their buttons are going to be the buttons of working class or poor people. So we can make presumptions. Uh, and uh, but definitely, you know, during what I call Jamestown chapter two and three, eighty percent of the residents would have been either enslaved or indentured servants. And there would have been a handful of rich people. Middle class people kind of left Jamestown and moved to the you know, the farmland. So Jamestown was full of either the poorest people or the richest people. But you'll notice that in places like Charleston and New Orleans, it's the same principle, where you'll see very, very wealthy people. I would say Manhattan, those places, and people who are very poor and very rarely people in the middle, because middle class people tend to live in the outskirts. That's true of our cities today. Very rich, very poor, and then the people in the middle kind of live outside. Jamestown's like that, and I find that interesting. All right, I think we'll do one last question. Um, what advice would you give to students out there who are interested in working in history or working at a historical site such as yourself? Yeah, so you're gonna have to take those kind of internships or entry level jobs that aren't, they're a little tough. They like young people to wear the costumes or do the like house tours. You know, you'll get the, I don't know what they pay now, but you'll get like the $10 an hour job, right? You gotta be willing to do two or three of those. Good to get a degree in something that's related to history, education, anthropology. Um, you got to do grunt work. Um, and I would encourage anyone who wants to do this full time, you're going to need a master's degree. Um, you didn't need it when I first started, but seriously, you really will because you're, you're, you're going to have to kind of um, get that extra education to kind of lower the pile of candidates. Um, takes a while, but now that I'm in like my 20th year of, of museum work, you know, now my boss allows me to write my own tours. I get to research my own stuff. You know, I didn't get to do that 10 years ago, 15 years ago. You have to pay your dues, but I kind of reached a level now where I get to really um, do my thing. And I have a lot of freedom. So, and I get to work at a place where the research is just happening all the time. But, you know, if, if you were asking me 20 years ago, I was wearing the, the Civil War costume, <laughs> leaving the house door for seven bucks an hour. You know the entry level stuff but you, you build that resume you get as much education as possible and then you just you 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 pay your dues it, it does pay off and you get to be you get to be on the other side of the rope if you know what i'm saying you get to see the things that the public can't get to touch and see and that's pretty cool and my classroom is the place where it happens it's a pretty great feeling well thank you for sharing that and, and thank you for the tour overall mark it's great to be with you and thank you for joining oh. Perfect. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm closing up things while I'm talking to you. But uh, yeah, we have like, I have five duties at the same time. That's another right. thing you got to know about museum work. You've got five things going on at once. But oh, anyway, I really appreciate you taking the time with us today. And if you have any further questions, just shoot me an email and I can answer them that way as well. So okay. if anybody has anything. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to get to them. All right. Well, thank you again. And thank you to everyone joining us today. Uh, we will have another program tomorrow, part of our Hispanic Heritage Month program. If you're free to join us at 4 p.m. Eastern time, same spot in our Facebook Live, we'll be virtually touring the San Juan National Historic Site. So hope to see you all there and have a beautiful rest of your day. All right, guys. Good to see everybody.